Good morning. Uh, also my part. It, it is my uh, great pleasure to, um, to chair this session on economics and biodiversity. Uh, so let me present uh, Theresa Kuchler, uh, Associate Professor at uh, NYU, and Katia Karousakis, a Biodiversity Program Leader at the OECD. Uh, Theresa presents for 25 minutes, Katja discusses for 15, and then it's time for questions. So when exactly a year ago uh, I said somewhat provocatively, I admit, that if you destroy nature, you destroy the economy, adding that this is not some flower power tree hugging exercise, but core economics, I was actually hoping that some of the best and brightest economists would take note. Little did I know that you, Theresa, uh, together with your co-authors, uh, would pick up that glove. And I want to thank you for that. And you moved the needle. You offer many key insights that all of us in this room and beyond should take that series. Let me mention just three. One, biodiversity decline, decline may not have caused large economic losses in the past, but past species loss has led to more fragile ecosystems, which means that any future losses in biodiversity, and I quote, will have increasingly severe economic repercussions. Policymakers should be aware of these non-linearities and proactively address threats to biodiversity before their economic impacts fully materialize. You're right. And indeed they should, I add. Your second point, biodiversity loss and climate change interact in important ways, but biodiversity loss is a conceptually distinct challenge from climate change. Both need to be analyzed in their own right, whilst at the same time accounting for the multiple interactions between the two. Your third point, do, or the one that I would like to highlight, due to their nature, scale, and non-linearities, um, the consequences of the twin nature and climate crises can never be fully understood by one academic profession alone. You stress the need for economists and ecologists to closely collaborate. Again, full agreement. As I said in a recent speech in Delphi, if ever there was an urgent need to pool knowledge and to draw on different fields of expertise, it is now. So is this the end of the journey? Certainly not. In your words, we hope that future work by us and other researchers can provide an even more comprehensive overview of the relationships between economic activity and nature. This paper provides a framework to determine the economic impacts of biodiversity loss and a foundation for economists and ecolog ecologists to collaborate on addressing, as you put it, one of society's most challenging, pressing challenges. I count on you and on many others to do just that. It is a vitally important endeavor. And with that, Theresa, the floor is yours for 25 minutes. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me and allowing me the opportunity to talk about work on the economics of biodiversity loss. This is joint work with Johannes Schrubel, who's also here, as well as Stefano Giglio and Olivier Rahn. So our work on this topic has been motivated by the accelerating loss in biodiversity we have seen over recent decades, where the rate at which species have become extinct has been much, much higher than background years in the centuries before. And this has raised substantial concerns across various quarters that this might affect economic activity and potentially financial stability. But from an economics perspective, when we look at existing models that incorporated nature or natural capital in these models, they usually consider a monolithic stock of natural capital. And by definition, that just doesn't allow us to think about the consequences of losing biodiversity. So this is where our paper comes in. 
And so the goal of our paper was to provide a framework to allow us to understand the economic implications of biodiversity loss. To that end, we focus on valuing biodiversity for humans through the value that nature and biodiversity provides to us by providing ecosystem services that serve as inputs into the production function to support economic activity. What are these ecosystem services? This ranges from provisioning services such as agriculture production of food or timber to regulating and supporting services such as pollination, cleaning air or water, or carbon sequestration. And so in our paper, we do three things to help us better understand the economics of biodiversity loss. First, we introduce a new model of the role of biodiversity in producing ecosystem services. We base these, this model on some key features documented in the ecology literature, and it turns out that one of the key sites that comes out of that literature and out of our model is that it's very important to consider the complex interactions of species, and we get much more complex and um, pointed specific predictions when we actually take that seriously. And so with that in hand, we can then apply the model to answer questions such as what are the economic risks from species loss. Second, we also incorporate a two-way interaction between biodiversity and the economy in the model. We've already started out incorporating the idea that ecosystem services enter as inputs into the production function. But we also incorporate the idea that production reduces biodiversity, for instance, by using land. And so this is necessary to have this two-way interaction because it will allow us to answer questions like optimal conservation, how much land should we um, protect given that there are economic costs to that. Finally, in the third part of the paper, we empirically test some implications of our model using asset prices, specifically CDS. Okay, so let me first tell you how we model biodiversity. We start out with an aggregate production function. This should be familiar to many of you, where aggregate output is a function of other factors of production as well as ecosystem services. Importantly, these other factors of production, such as physical capital or labor, and ecosystem services are complements. That's well established in the um, existing literature, and until here we really follow what's been done. The idea of complement simply means that a decline in ecosystem services is hard to offset by an accumulation of capital labor. You can think of it, well, if we, we lose pollination services, that's pretty hard to compensate for with additional machines or uh, human labor. So this is where most of the existing literature stopped and analyzed this function. But what we really want to analyze is we want to understand the complex interactions of species in providing ecosystem services, and so now we need to model them. We're going to start with the observation from the ecology literature that a healthy ecosystem consists of multiple ecosystem functions that provide distinct ecosystem services. So you can think of things like pollination, nutrient cycling, carbon sequestration. And so we're going to split up our aggregate ecosystem functions in these different complementary ecosystem functions. Importantly, these are complementary. Again, stressing the idea that these are different functions and we cannot compensate, say, for a loss in pollination by an increase in nutrient um, recycling. These are just different things and we'll need both for a healthy ecosystem. Formally, we model this by the following CES aggregator. This is a commonly used tool in economics, um, and the key parameter here is the sigma parameter, which captures the complementarity between the functions. So then at the next level, we use species. So there are different species that all contribute to providing certain ecosystem services. And here we incorporate two insights from the ecology literature that result in species being substitutable, so they're to some extent redundant. There are multiple species, say bees and butterflies, that all provide pollination services, but they're imperfectly so. 
they're not the same. They use and require resources in different ways. And this, what is called niche differentiation in the ecology literature, allows a more diverse population to be more productive. And this substitutability, but imperfect substitutability, um, results in productivity being increasing, but concave in biodiversity, in the diversity of species within a function. Again, we aggregate the contribution of these different species to the ecosystem services provided in a function with a CES aggregator. The key parameter is again the um, exponent, in this case epsilon, which here captures the substitutability between species. So we have two layers. First, ecosystem functions that are complementary to each other, and underneath that, different species which are imperfectly substitutable. Okay, with this model in mind, we can start thinking about what happens if we use, lose biodiversity. We're going to model the loss of biodiversity by a decrease in the number of species. So let's see what happens. First, with infection. It turns out that the effect on function level output depends on two parameters. The substitutability between species, which we already captured with epsilon, as well as the extent of compensatory growth of other species. This means if one species in an ecosystem dies, there are more resources now that are no longer used by the species, and we expect other species to some extent grow and compensate for that, but generally this is imperfect. And so when we have more substitutability or, and or more compensatory growth, we will have a flatter curve in terms of how much ecosystem function productivity drops when we lose species. We get a higher resilience to initial losses, and we will have more ecosystem function productivity at all levels of biodiversity. Okay, so now we know what determines when we lose a species, the output of ecosystem services in this specific ecosystem function where we have lost a species. But we want to think about what this means for aggregate output. So now we're going to look at what that means across functions for the aggregate provision of ecosystem services. In the model, we find that the complementarity across function amplifies the within function concavity. So at the aggregate, we have a more concave relationship between species loss and the production of ecosystem services. We also show that the decline in, function, in one function's output only reduces overall ecosystem output when this function is binding due to the complementarity between these ecosystems. If another function is already scarce and restricting the overall production of ecosystem services, this new loss in a different function will not actually affect aggregate ecosystem production very much because it's already constrained by other factors. Only when the new function becomes binding due to accumulated losses would we see an aggregate effect on ecosystem services. So now, aggregate ecosystem services, when do we see an effect on aggregate output? And here, the same logic that we just saw at the function level applies. The effect on output will depend on the relative abundance of other factors of production. So a loss in aggregate ecosystem services will only affect aggregate output if ecosystem services are a binding constraining factor in the production of aggregate output. If that is not the case, potentially because output is already constrained by the lack of physical capital or human capital, other factors of production, then the loss of ecosystem services will not actually result in a large loss in productivity and output because we are already constrained and we're losing a relatively abundant factor which does not have a strong effect on economic output. There are some additional implications that come out of this analysis. So if you've seen, we had this concave curve 
at what happens at the function level when we lose biodiversity. This concavity is reinforced at every step through the complementarity at the function level as well as the aggregate level. But what this also means is that initial losses of biodiversity, we would expect them to have initially small effects on output. But each additional loss will reduce the economy's resilience to future losses. And so to just put it very plainly, what this means is that the fact that we have not seen large losses due to the immense decline in biodiversity that we have seen in recent years does not at all imply that future losses will be similarly small. In fact, the model predicts that the loss from each additional species that is lost will become increasingly bigger until we reach that tipping point where we have no species left that could provide um, these services. The model also shows how the effects of biodiversity loss are very context dependent. First of all, if we have losses of species that are concentrated in a few functions or in those with very little redundancy to begin with, these are particularly damaging to the overall provision of ecosystem services. Because as species go extinct, the remaining species are more likely to become keystone species that don't have a functional replacement, where if we lose those, the provision of that specific ecosystem service would collapse. Finally, the model also implies that the marginal economic value of a species differs substantially across functions, countries, and ecosystems. And this is true even for the same species that can have a much higher economic value in one ecosystem or in one country compared to another ecosystem in another country because the economic value of that species depends on the other species that are still there and the context in which um, this happens. And so that means that understanding these um, trade-offs and the complexity of the different values of species is important if you want to think about targeting conservation efforts in a world where conservation efforts are somewhat um, restricted by um, you know, the willingness of the public to support these. Okay, with this analysis of our species loss in place, we can also use our framework to think about biodiversity risk assessment. If you think about risk, there are three components that go into this. Hazard, how likely are we to use an ecosystem service? Exposure, how exposed is an entity like a firm or a country to um, this ecosystem? And vulnerability, how vulnerable are they? Well, how many damages would there be if this ecosystem was lost? And in recent years, there's been tremendous work, particularly here in Europe, in understanding especially the last two, exposure and vulnerability. Our framework can speak really to the first part of this, the hazard. What is the likelihood of losing ecosystem services due to biodiversity loss? And so in the paper, we propose a formal definition of ecosystem fragility. This is um, our decomposition, and I'll just briefly walk you through it. The first factor that determines ecosystem fragility is a direct loss when we lose a species of community abundance, e.g. biomass, like the animals go extinct, there are fewer animals now. The second loss comes from a lower functional diversity. And this is due to a change in niche differentiation where lower levels of biodiversity means the remaining species where there are fewer of them now are able to only use the resources less efficient. And finally, we get a change in the cross-function imbalances. And this is something that it becomes particularly important as we keep on losing species, especially if these species losses are concentrated in a few functions where some functions become very scarce and very constraining on both the provision of ecosystem services as well as ultimately um, aggregate economic output. And so we hope that this framework can help translate ecological findings about which species are being lost into their economic effects. 
Obviously, there's um, a long way to go between providing a guidance of what we want to measure and actually implementing these measures, but we hope that this at least tells us how to work together with the ecologists to translate their findings into economically meaningful uh, variables that help us understand the effects on economic output. Okay. So now I've told you a lot about the model. So you might wonder whether there's any evidence that what I've shown you is reflected in the real world and is not just a theory. So our model predicts that biodiversity loss um, has an effect on current and future economic outpack. The empirical challenge is testing this. The issue is that both aggregate output and changes in biodiversity are slow moving, so we have very few observations and there are many confounds, many other things happening at the same time. In addition, as I just argued, we actually would expect that a large portion of the losses in biodiversity that are economically meaningful comes from this reduced resilience to future shocks, which by definition we're not able to observe today. So to solve this question and give some insight into to what extent this matters empirically, we turn to asset prices. Asset prices have the advantage that already today they reflect market participants' expectations about future output. They incorporate news upon arrival, and so we can actually test today what effect these news have on what people expect for the future, future shocks, resilience to future output shocks. Here, we're going to focus on CDS spreads as high-frequency measures of the expected economic tail risk for countries. And so we're going to ask, do CDS spreads move upon bad news about biodiversity loss? If you're wondering what we mean by bad news, um, we rely on our earlier work where we have used textual analysis of the news about biodiversity in the New York Times to identify an index that tells us whether on a given day to what extent we have good versus bad news about potential future losses from biodiversity. We are also asking to test additional model predictions how this co-movement of CDS spreads with biodiversity news might vary with two variables. The first one is the existing level of biodiversity degradation, where empirically we use Yale's EPI, the Environmental Performance Index, to measure the state of biodiversity in a given country. Our model would predict that in countries where biodiversity is less degraded, CDS spreads should be less sensitive to news. Similarly, our model predicts that we should see variation in how likely it is that biodiversity is the constraining factor in e for economic output. And so to measure that, we use the share of renewable natural capital as a fraction of a country's total capital, which is available uh, through some data provided by the World Bank as a proxy for this. The idea is if you have a high share of natural capital, either because you have abundant natural capital or you have very little physical capital, it is less likely that ecosystem services are the constraining factor in aggregate production. And so we would expect that overall economic output is less sensitive. Okay, let's test this in the data. First, we do find that CDS spreads increase following negative biodiversity news. To give you a number, a one standard deviation increase in bad news is associated with a 0.157% increase in CDS spreads. Turning to our interactions, consistent with the model, we find that CDS spreads are less sensitive when biodiversity is less degraded, and we also find they are less sensitive when there is a higher share of natural capital in the country, which suggests that not natural but physical capital is a constraining factor of production, and so losses of nature do not directly translate into losses of aggregate output. Summing up, it appears that financial markets appear to care about biodiversity risk, prices of CDS move when news emerge, and this is also consistent with some of our earlier work that indicated that these risks are priced in the cross-section of US equities. Finally, we want to um, look at this two-way interaction between biodiversity and the economy. So far, 
We've seen how biodiversity supplies ecosystem services that help produce economic output. But the paper also discusses the other direction. And we model this by incorporating land use in the production function, where land use um, helps produce goods today, but it degrades future biodiversity. And so then, that leaves a policy question where you want to trade off optimal land use, where you trade off current output versus um, future intact biodiversity via uh, conservation. In general, for people who know this literature, we uh, generalize the classic analysis of optimal extraction of exhaustible resources to our specific case of biodiversity, which has some additional features. What we find is that because biodiversity loss today makes ecosystems more fragile in the future, there's an additional incentive rather compared to these uh, classic models for early conservations. We also find that the dynamics can be very complex. It can be nonlinear, state, and context dependent. That suggests that thinking about and quantifying what is optimal conservation is non-trivial. It also tells you that to the extent that there's uncertainty, something we don't capture in our model, but maybe we have uncertainty about the exact relationships um, in between nature and the economy, between different um, species, if we have this uncertainty, it introduces additional precautionary motors. Finally, the model also helps us a little bit better understand the different incentives for conservation between capital-rich and capital-poor economies. In capital-rich economies, it is more likely that ecosystem services are the constraining factor of production. And so therefore, we would expect capital-rich economies to have higher incentives for pr preservation today. On the other hand, in capital-poor economies, nature is comparably abundant, largely because other capital and other factors of production are scarce. And so there is incentive to use land for production now, partially compensating for the lack of other capital. But it is important to keep in mind that while in these countries a loss of biodiversity might not show up in losses of current output, the degradation of egg biodiversity destroys the opportunities for future development. It will destroy the possibilities that countries can later accumulate capital or human capital and then grow if they've degraded their nature to the extent that that will no longer be possible. Finally, the model also points out that if you have myopic decision makers, they have an incentive to overexploit ecosystems, and so there is space for welfare improvement that could come from regulating or incentivizing conservation if you think that current decision makers are too myopic relative to a social plan. Okay. Let me conclude. Um, to analyze the economics of biodiversity loss, we do three things in our paper. We model the role of biodiversity in producing ecosystem services, as well as the two-way interaction between biodiversity and the economy. We show empirically that asset markets already today incorporate biodiversity risk. Our model can hopefully serve, and I hope some of you will find this helpful, as a conceptual framework for a whole range of policy applications, and hopefully also start, be a starting point for the collaboration with ecologists to measure some of these objects. There's a large literature in ecology, but translating what of that is relevant for our economic models is non-trivial, and hopefully here we can give some pointers of which magnitude matter for translating this econ into economic output. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Theresa, uh, also for sticking uh, very closely to the time. That's much, much appreciated. Katja, the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be here today. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure. And I would also, before I begin, I would just like to acknowledge the ECB for putting biodiversity on the agenda so prominently um, here today. Uh, biodiversity and climate change are part of the triple planetary crisis, and biodiversity in particular is one that diver uh, deserves much more attention across the policy agendas, 
governments, uh, finance institutions, etc. So it's great to see this um, manifested here as well today. I'll start uh, by taking a step back uh, to provide some further context on the state of biodiversity, its links to the economy, um, and, and why it is so important. So uh, we have here um, a figure from the Living Planet Index, uh, which highlights uh, that the populations of vertebrates, so mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish, have shrunk by an average of 69% since 1970, so in a period of 50 years, um, massive decline, unprecedented. Um, this is just one aspect of biodiversity. Biodiversity encompasses species, ecosystems, and genetic diversity. Um, and this just illustrates one element of that. Um, and the fact is that declines in species richness and abundance negatively affects ecosystem functions, productivity, as well as resilience. In addition to this, uh, which illustrates the species, many of the world's terrestrial, freshwater, and marine ecosystems have been destroyed or degraded. Uh, with just some um, factoid statistics that humans have significantly altered 75% of land cover and 66% of oceans is subject to increasing cumulative impacts. So these are some of the findings from the IPBES, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services from um, 2019. And just to note, that these trends are projected to continue under business as usual scenarios. And why is this important? Because biodiversity provides these critical ecosystem services um, uh, that are underpinning all aspects of human uh, well-being and our economy. Um, the fact that these ecosystem services are not priced into our markets, what Professor Descopta called in his uh, review on the economics of uh, biodiversity as invisible and silent. Um, and they include a number of, of different types of services, pollination services, which are critical for food, clean water provisioning, climate regulation, amongst many, many others. And again, uh, massive levels of decline across these different ecosystem services, with IPBES highlighting that there's been a decline in 14 out of 18 categories of ecosystem services since 1970 including uh, flood erosion, uh, uh, flood erosion and disease control, and also pollination. So how does this translate into uh, uh, nature-related risks? Here we have the figure with the five key global pressures on biodiversity loss, land use change, overexploitation of natural resources, climate change, and invasive alien species. And just to point out here, also based on uh, what Teresa was saying, that biodiversity and climate change are intricately linked, with biodiversity loss driving climate change and climate change driving biodiversity loss. So they're two sides of the same coin and need to be also examined um, together. These types of uh, degradation lead to both physical risks and also transition risks. Um, through the different ecosystem services and also by um, misaligned policies, um, resulting in different types of economic risks, as illustrated here, um, and then uh, the financial risks, uh, covering a range of different types of risks. Um, some examples is that economic activities depend on nature, uh, may be affected by supply chain disruptions, reduced turnover or inability to produce, which can also result in large losses for any institutions lending to these. In addition, in addition to these, we also have the potential for tipping points. So when ecosystems reach uh, a state uh, where they beyond the capacity of the environment, um, and irreversible uh, changes, et cetera, which you can't bounce back from. Some examples of these are more than 400 dead zones in marine ecosystems, fish stocks uh, collapsing, et cetera. 
and also a number of different evidence, such as that agricultural systems, in agricultural systems, for example, greater crop diversity has been shown to reduce the variance of both agricultural yields and also farmers' incomes. And what we are seeing today is a number of recent studies by central banks around the world have highlighted the high degree of dependence and exposure of financial portfolios to nature-related risks, including the Netherlands, France, Brazil, Malaysia, Mexico, and most recently also Hungary. In terms of policy context, at the um, international level, uh, more than 100, 196 parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity agreed to the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework in December 2022. So this sort of guides all countries on how they intend to address biodiversity loss um, at the international level, but then also domestically. And I've just highlighted here some of the targets that are uh, most relevant in this context here, um, such as target 14, which is to ensure the full integration of biodiversity and its multiple values into policies and regulations, um, and to progressively align all relevant public and private activities and the fiscal and financial flows with the goals and targets of this framework. Target 15 calls for governments to take legal, administrative, or policy measures to encourage and enable business, um, and in particular, large and transnational companies and financial institutions to monitor, um, assess, and transparently disclose their risks, dependencies, and impacts on biodiversity um, in order to reduce the negative impacts on biodiversity and to increase the positive impacts. Target 18 uh, refers to the need to reform incentives harmful to biodiversity and to also scale up positive incentives for biodiversity. So these types of positive incentives are, for example, the biodiversity offsets, uh, the Begovian taxes, a number of different other types of um, policy instruments that can be used to um, internalize the negative externalities from biodiversity loss. And also target 19, which is to increase the level of financial resources from all sources, uh, public and private, to mobilize at least 200 billion per year by 2030. Um, and in this context now, uh, the next COP, CBD COP, COP 16, which is taking place in, um, in October in Cali, um, the parties to the convention will be required, are supposed to come to the COP with their updated and revised national biodiversity strategies and action plans, highlighting how these international targets will be um, implemented um, at the domestic level. In this context, there are many, many recent initiatives that are bound. Uh, we've seen the TNFD, uh, the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, which was launched in 2021. Uh, with disclosure recommendations released in 2023. The NGFS framework, which is intended to help banks, uh, central banks and supervisors identify and assess sources of nature-related uh, transition and physical uh, risks released in 2023. The science-based uh, tar uh, targets for nature, which is providing guidance for companies to assess their value chain-wide impacts on nature to prioritize, to set targets, to act and to track, and a number of regulatory policies that are also emerging, such as the EU Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive um, and several others. Um, this is also all part of um, showing the momentum that is building in the context of, of biodiversity across uh, many, many different stakeholders. So how does this paper uh, fit into this sort of more international, uh, broader picture? Um, just to highlight, um, if one discards the decades of work in environmental economics, at least since uh, papers such as Descopta and Heal from 1974, from the category of mainstream growth economics, Mainstream theories of economic growth have essentially ignored the demands of economic activity that it places on biodiversity, and the constraints that the biosphere places on economic activity. In this context, it's great to see uh, 
work coming out also from finance economists. It's, uh, you know, it's becoming more mainstream. I think this is an important first step. Um, and uh, the paper integrates ecological insights, so deep ecological um, foundations uh, with economic modeling um, to provide a sophisticated model to understand the economic impacts of biodiversity loss. So really focusing on the, the diversity of, of the species as an underlying sort of foundation of the model, um, while also remaining uh, tractable. Um, it's a comprehensive model with a hierarchical constant elasticity of substitution um, and effectively captures the complex interactions between, uh, within ecosystems and their economic implications. And it provides a novel way to reduce complexity and to capture the nonlinear relationships and interdependencies between different species and their roles within the ecosystem. As Teresa indicated, it also empirically tests the model via CDS spreads and the biodiversity news index um, to validate uh, the, uh, the intuitive results from, from the model. Um, and in this context also provides new insights in a very nascent biodiversity-related financial literature compared to, for example, climate change. And I'd just like to highlight some of the reasons, I think, for this very nascent literature in the context of, of biodiversity versus climate. First, I mean, we know climate has received a lot more attention from academia, from policymakers, etc., cetera, um, with biodiversity lagging a little bit behind. I think one of the reasons of this is the simplicity, in a sense, in uh, like little earmarks um, of climate, where we have a ton of CO2 equivalent, so uh, a relatively easy metric from which to um, do comparative analysis, etc. With biodiversity, given its multidimensionality, um, its complexity, um, it's been, I think, harder to sort of rally in, um, in, a, in a more comparable way and to, to gather momentum around in this context. Um, um, and also the multiple different, in, different indicators that are available, et cetera, and making also uh, data fit for purpose depending on, on who's um, going to need it for. Um, this is changing, um, and I'll come back to this at the very end. Just some comments on the paper. Um, it does cover a lot of ground. Um, I am, it's uh, I would, like certainly dense in, in some places, I would say, um, and which is necessary given that it is uh, you know, bringing together both ecological insights and economic modeling insights. Um, I think in certain places it could guide um, the readers more. I'll come to that in a second again. Um, the empirical evaluation um, is, is very interesting, um, that, uh, that the news about biodiversity loss increases CDS spread suggests that investors are recognizing biodiversity loss as a financial risk. So really, uh, really groundbreaking to be able to see that, and not many papers are looking at these issues at all today. Just a few questions on um, the environmental performance index index that was used to look at exposure for different countries, um, whether other types of proxies were also considered, such as mean species abundance, etc. cetera. Um, wondering whether it's, it would be possible to test the results across different sort of more specific regional countries to see are these types of, uh, are, are these risks being recognized across all types of countries, like maybe US versus Europe, you know, is there um, more forward, sort of, or more evolved thinking in, in certain places than in others? Um, also, very interesting um, f for policymakers in general, uh, the paper refers to the applicability uh, of the model to inform optimal land use, uh, biodiversity offsets, Pigovian taxes. So these are critical issues um, where there has been a lot of work, but this model provides the possibility to apply it in a more sort of targeted manner. Um, and in a way, this paper, I think, could be three or four papers. <laughs> um, it sort of touches upon it or hints upon it, but I think um, either 
a little bit more elaboration or uh, turning it into you know opportunities for further work abound I think as a result of, of the use of uh, the, the development of the model um, and with that um, just to highlight that it is a nascent but rapidly expanding literature overall, and I don't only mean, I'm not talking necessarily about the finance um, economics, um, although we are beginning to see a few studies that are looking into these issues. Um, I'm hopeful uh, that as biodiversity receives more attention in the coming years, I mean, I think it's been tremendous what's been achieved in the past five years, and I think uh, the next five years will yield even more data, the opportunities thereby to conduct further analysis, to do evidence-based analysis, and to um, understand better what the types of different risks are, the economic implications, et cetera. So thanks very much, um, and looking forward to comments and questions afterwards. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Katja. Um, um, it's very interesting. Um, before I open the floor for, for questions, is there anything you would like to maybe react uh, really quickly to Katja uh, Theresa? Yeah, no, I uh, thank you so much for these comments and this discussion, especially providing uh, some background. Just to answer your specific question, um, in addition to the EPI, we did try the Environmental Vulnerability Index. The specific using looking at mean species abundance, um, we think is not a particularly good measure to capture the forces in the model, because that's something that compares across ecosystems that differ in how species rich they are. But the model really tells us that what matters is how degraded a given ecosystem is. And so we wanted to compare to the kind of original state of the ecosystem. And we think these indicators capture that a little bit better. Um, also, your point about um, the paper raises a lot of questions and could flesh out some of those more. Um, we couldn't agree more. Um, to us, this is really the starting point of hopefully more work. Um, I, I think, you know, relative to what we saw before, I think you have to keep in mind that we saw something on inflation. Communists have been writing on inflation for like decades. They're like thousands over thousands of papers. So we are at a pretty good understanding of what that means, and so we can really dig into these. That's totally not the case for biodiversity. So I think when we worked on this paper, we it just opened up a whole range of additional topics where we were like, yes, that would be great to flesh out more. There's just some limit of what we could do in the recent month and in one paper. Um, but hopefully, you know, we are planning to work on this and hopefully others join us in this effort. And so I'm hopeful that we'll have all of these um, you know, applied to more specific policy questions in the near future. Excellent. Now, so this is a nascent field, so there must be many questions. Please, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much for this presentation and for the paper. In fact, um, it is a very important nascent field. And I have a few questions relating to the way that you uh, capture and model, um, mm -hmm. ultimately, the ecosystem benefits. Because it would seem that there is a big difference between pollination and nutrition uh, services, which are local and which imply the land use uh, problem locally and more global ecosystem services such as carbon capture or complementarities in which uh, the ecosystem size may matter, maybe more than individual species loss, uh, which, is, which is what you're focusing on here. So, so I wonder whether, whether you can uh, speak to that as well or if we have thought about that. And that partly relates to the question of the funding and financing uh, of ecosystem services globally. Can we make some kind of uh, a uh, analogy to the way that we are thinking about carbon, uh, not only pricing, but also carbon markets and credits internationally, so therefore making it available for offsets? Hold your fire for a while. I see Yannis, and then there's a question at the very end, but I didn't bring my glasses, so I couldn't see the, the name. But, there, but first, Yannis. Thank you. I think this is a fascinating paper, at least for me, that uh, I'm not a specialist. But it raises many questions, uh, not only those questions that you have raised, but for our job as, uh, as um, central bankers, for instance, if there is one more factor of production, biodiversity, uh, it, 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 it has a shadow value, okay, which is increasing because, as you have shown in the diagram, uh, the quality of di di bio 
diversity is declining, and this is a complementary factor to capital. So the shadow price of diversity uh, must be rising, but we do not observe it. Uh, or uh, if there is a market price, it's, it, it must be much smaller than the shadow price. So what are the policy implications? Second, do we measure total factor productivity growth correctly? If uh, there is uh, this factor of production, which is so crucial, it, it must be. Um, so one of the uh, reasons, uh, one of the dimensions of total factor productivity growth is not captured by, by our analysis because the national accounts do not include this factor and its price. Hmm. So what, what are the implications, you think? Thank you. We take that one more question and then uh, I'll give you the floor, Therese. Yes. Um, very interesting uh, issues. Uh, I would say there are two dimensions to that. One is uh, understanding the phenomena, and I think that's, that's uh, key. And it's very uh, reassuring that financial markets uh, uh, are looking into that um, and are aware of the issues. Um, and I know that uh, Frank is, is, is very much involved in making sure that banks in particular are aware of the, of the issues, and we are all working on that. Um, and one question in this respect is non-linearities. Because the correlation uh, development or growth, biodiversity, and then maybe less growth or more variable growth, and, and maybe uh, at a certain level of development, biodiversity starts to increase again. One of the interesting charts you showed about the reduction in animals uh, um, uh, uh, show that at the end, basically, it, fl it flattered out. And I want to come to the second issue, which is policy, uh, with an example. I mean, in the richest uh, region in Italy, biodiversity seems to be increasing again uh, with bears. Bears are, are flooding the region for some reason, and they are creating a political issue, actually. And uh, because uh, it's forbidden in Italy to kill bears, but bears are creating a problem uh, to the point that people are going to vote against those uh, parties that are more in favor of biodiversity. So when it comes to policy, what are the policy recommendations uh, and the policy choices that are at stake? Uh, um, and who takes this decision? Uh, uh, because these are key political issues, and we saw in the recent elections in Europe in particular that some, if you push too much on certain agendas, you can have backfire. So what would you advise to policymakers to how to treat this issue in particular? Thanks, uh, thanks Lorenzo, and when I heard your voice, I immediately knew it was you, but I couldn't see from so far. But thanks for your question. Theresa, I go um, to you, and then maybe Katja, you want to pitch in as well, please. Perfect. Yeah, let me start with the question local versus global. The current version of the paper has one um, economy and one ecosystem. And so in some sense, you can think of that as ether being the world economy, or you can think of this as being one country and its ecosystem. Um, I think you point out something um, that, that we've thought about where we have some ecosystem functions that really need to be provided locally and some that uh, could be provided globally and also are to some extent tradable. Like carbon sequestration is tradable, timber is tradable, agriculture production to some extent is tradable, but things like clean air, clean water, nutrient, um, Recycling is not tradable. And so this is something in the um, extent to which these services are tradable that we don't currently have in the model. It is actually on the top of the list of things that we think would be super interesting to look into um, because we do think it might give you some um, additional uh, predictions on that. Um, and so the other thing you spoke about offsets and pricing, I think in some extent the current version of the model already could allow you to guide you in that direction because I think the main thing you want to think about, and this is I think very different from what we see in the climate change literature, where like one ton of carbon is one ton of carbon. And so it really doesn't matter where I, um, you know, where I absorb it back or where I sequester it. 
That's not true for biodiversity. Like a species in a certain ecosystem at like one point is not the same as even the same species at some other parcel. And so that becomes more complicated if you really want to design um, ecosystem services. But I do think it's a starting point. No? Like once we understand the complexities, we could actually start measuring them and designing these um, exchange rates and then think about how to finance those and um, you know, what, what the prices for those um, might be. Um, let me answer Lorenzo's question next. Um, yes, I think it's very important, obviously, to understand this. There are a, non, a lot of non-linearities and tipping points, and they actually do come out directly of the framework that we already have. So we don't actually need to hardwire them out of these two CES aggregators, which, you know, the economists among you know are very, very standard tools in economics. We get all these tipping points, non-linearities. Um, so that makes the model somewhat tractable, as tractable as these um, big models can be. Um, talking about policy, um, yes, there is absolutely a, um, you know, scope for biodiversity to increase again. And I think you rightly point out to the conflict of interest that we have when we think about how to use land and how to use nature. Humans have an incentive to use nature, to use land, because it does provide us with services. And so that degrades biodiversity to some extent, but the services we get are somewhat useful. People like to use them. And so that is a clear trade-off that I think policymakers have to think about, and they have to communicate with their constituencies and in, you know, specific to their situation, what they think optimal policies would be um, that balance these um, two um, forces. Coming to you, um, share the price of biodiversity policy implication in TFP. Um, so I, I think you're right that um, biodiversity is a factor into production that we don't see priced. If you don't observe a shadow price, um, to some extent that might be driven that by the fact that we would only really see this being crucial at the point where biodiversity services are the constraining factor to production. If they are not, then it's somewhat abundantly supplied and um, the you know, kind of efficient, the, the effective price might, might be zero. Um, incorporating this into more aggregate accounting, I, I think that's right, that this is a factor um, to production that we might um, benefit from measuring. Um, to this extent, you know, it, I feel like Central banks and people who measure TFP are already doing a tremendous job in trying to capture these things. And the fact that we don't always capture every pact of production perfectly um, is in some sense understandable because it is very hard to measure. But I do think that the next step in this research will hopefully be to take this a little bit more seriously and think about which ecosystem services are entering into production function. How scarce, how abundant are they in a given economy? So to better judge also for policy, but also for measurement, um, where you might want to uh, target things like conservation efforts. Question, would you like to pitch in as well? Just very quickly on, on the point with the biodiversity offsets. So because of the fact that we don't have a ton of CO2 equivalent for biodiversity, um, it's a much more difficult to have international trading of biodiversity offsets. And in fact, it's frowned upon because you want to ensure like for like. If you destroy X amount, how are you going to make up for it? And you don't want to underestimate and make errors. Um, but you have seen, for example, on the voluntary carbon markets where you have certain types of you know, carbon offsets which have premiums for biodiversity. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a small way to incorporate that into, into, into international trading. But generally, in countries where you have mandatory biodiversity offset programs, they really are um, only for domestic, domestic purposes. So you don't introduce international sort of uncertainties as well. All right, with that, I see there are more questions, but I will um, um, stick to the time frame. Um, so I would like to bring this, uh, this session to an end. Um, it's six years ago that the Central Bank and um, Supervisors Network for Green and Financial System uh, said that climate-related risks are a source of financial risk and therefore are squarely within 
the remit and mandate of central banks and supervisors. It's four years ago that the same NGFS said that biodiversity related risks are a source of financial risk and therefore are squarely within the mandate of central banks and supervisors. Um, the NGFS today has 138 members. All institutions who are represented here today in this room are members. And this is a statement we made four years ago. So you now having contributed in, I think, the very core of the, um, the, the pinnacle of the intellectual exchange that we as an ECB have with ourselves and with the rest of the world. Um, having brought it here today to this stage, I think is a very big step. It's a nascent field, Yanni said, or somebody else that, um, you know, we are not uh, experts here. This is one of these fields where nobody is an expert yet. This is a field where seminal papers will be written and Nobel Prizes will be won. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.